to be discussing uh, OHS's exhibit, Nevertheless, They Persisted, Women's Voting Rights in the 19th Amendment. Um, the exhibit was scheduled to open actually on March 13th of last year, but it didn't end up opening until July because of the COVID restrictions and then closed again in the fall, um, but has now been extended through December 5th to give folks a chance to visit. And OHS has just reopened again for week, uh, weekend hours and also um, this week for spring break week. Um, so I hope you'll be able to get a chance to come see it in person at some point. Um, but I wanted to give you a sneak preview and highlight some of the wonderful artifacts and images included. Um, there are over 100 objects and a large number of historic photos in the exhibit. Um, a lot more than we'll have time to cover today, but at least this will give you a sense of some of the items that are in there. Um, so I thought we could go through uh, the process first um, that we use to create the exhibition. Um, exhibit ideas typically come from a lot of different places, but this idea came from uh, a couple of OHS staff members who recognized that we had this very significant centennial coming up um, with the 100 year anniversary of the 19th amendment in 2020. And um, they suggested that we commemorate that event and the many people, the many women and men who fought for women's suffrage. Um, so in early 2019, we began putting together an advisory group of historians with expertise in suffrage history and the advisors met with OHS several times and they were kind enough to provide us with a lot of different um, ideas, uh, people they thought we should highlight in the exhibit, historical events they thought were important. Um, and so I started compiling all of that information. And then um, as I started to put together the exhibit content outline, um, they were reviewing that and giving us feedback. And um, they also reviewed the exhibit text um, once I wrote all of that. Um, they also helped us brainstorm big ideas for the exhibit, which um, the big idea is like the main message that we want visitors to walk away with. Um, and for this one, we ended up landing on a question that we wanted the exhibit to answer. And that is, how did women and men in America and Oregon in particular, persist and achieve women's suffrage and the 19th Amendment. So with all of the advisor's ideas, I ended up creating an outline with the basic structure of the content. And then I began researching all these topics and historical figures um, and looking in various archives and collections to find the different photos and objects that we hoped would fill in the story. Um, but the majority of the objects are from OHS's own collections. So uh, we also began working with a team of exhibit designers and fabricators um, who designed and built the exhibit, and then OHS staff and contractors installed the exhibit. Um, so the exhibit is about 3,000 square feet, and it is on our one of our main galleries. Uh, it has 13 sections that are um, there's both a chronological timeline and also um, an arrangement by subject. And the timeline goes throughout the exhibit and spans about 200 years. There are also many objects, images, projected film, ambient audio, audio and interactives. And the exhibit um, has this kind of interesting design on printed cloth banners with graphic panels and vinyl. And I just um, wanted to note too, these are all, all of these images are from in the exhibit. Um, so, and because of the cloth banners, you may actually see lights shining through um, sometimes just to let you know. Uh, but I do think the, it gives a really beautiful effect to these banners um, in person. So the exhibit begins with discussion of some reasons why women could not vote in America. And one was the tradition of coverture. 
Um, and that was an idea brought over by the British um, and it originated with the Normans in France. Um, and in this tradition, a married woman was a femme covert, which literally means covered woman. And it means, um, it goes back to the idea that women were considered to be in need of protection. They needed to be pro provided for by men. So they were covered women. Um, and this that you're seeing on the screen here is the record of proceedings from an 18th century American court case. Um, a court justice was ruling on the ability of a femme covert to convey property. Um, and that was in question because women could typically not own property unless they inherited it from a man, especially married women. So another tradition that affected women's rights was the concept of Republican motherhood. Um, that was pervasive among Euro-American families from the American colonies up into the 19th century, even into maybe the early 20th century. And it held that women were important in building the nation, but they were meant to oversee the domestic sphere of the household, including education of the children, and men would control the political and business spheres for the household. But as time went on, many American women became dissatisfied with their ability to, um, to exercise their citizenship rights during the early to mid 19th century. Um, they firmly believed that as citizens, they already held the same rights as men. So beginning in the mid 1800s, um, a lot of American women and men began to form a woman's suffrage movement. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of the people that was uh, a founder of that movement. And she and other activists held the first American Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Um, and at that convention, she laid out a list of all of the sen sentiments and um, rights demanded by women, which was the declaration of sen sentiments that you see here. And that included the right to vote. Um, the interesting thing about that, the right to vote uh, was the most controversial of all of those sentiments because many people, women and men alike, believe that still believe that women should not be involved in politics. Um, and this document you see here is a reproduction of that document from the Library of Congress. So many more suffrage conferences followed and rights organizations across the country were founded um, more and more every day. And in 1851, Katie Stanton met Susan B. Anthony um, and she was an abolitionist from New York and uh, Katie Stanton convinced Anthony to be working towards the cause of women's rights. Um, so they began a lifelong partnership in the suffrage fight with Katie Stanton writing articles and lectures, um, speeches, and Anthony would travel the country um, on lecture tours, actually giving these speeches. This ticket is one of my favorite items in the exhibit, and it is um, it was generously loaned by Lewis and Clark College. It's an original ticket from a lecture by Susan B. Anthony that she gave in 1871 in Oregon. It was her first visit to Oregon. And the title of the lecture, Women Already Voters, it refers to the fact that suffragists really believed that women already had citizenship rights and already had voting rights. So in Oregon, um, the first suffrage organizations were founded in the early 1870s, um, first in Salem and Albany, and then in Portland pretty quickly after. This is a record book from 1873 from Oregon's first statewide suffrage organization, which was the Oregon State Equal Suffrage Association. And that was founded by Abigail Scott Dunaway. And this is open to the first page with Abigail Scott Dunaway's handwritten bylaws. And it also includes the names and addresses of some of the first members. So the first women suffragists in America, um, many of them were also abolitionists. And in the earliest days, the two movements worked very closely together. 
Um, so from left to right, you see here Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Frederick Douglass, and they were all abolitionists and women suffragists. Um, but over time, fractures began to form in the movement uh, during the time leading up to the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870. Um, and the reason for that was that white suffragists were angered that the 15th Amendment, which was meant to aid enslaved people, um, formerly enslaved people, included voting rights for African American men, but left out women. And throughout the following years, women of color were often uh, excluded or marginalized by the white suffragists who should have been their allies. So as a result, women of color across the country began to form their own suffrage organizations, their own rights organizations um, to fight for their own interests. And even with the 15th Amendment, there were still frequent attempts in many parts of the country to block African-Americans from voting. And this document is a flyer produced around 1918 by one of the national suffrage organizations, and it specifically shows um, their efforts to appease southern states, southern politicians, and convince them that uh, a woman's suffrage amendment would not greatly increase the voting power of African Americans. So Western states began moving towards women's voting rights much earlier than in the East. Um, and that was in part because Western states were looking to expand their voting citizenship um, because of their lower population numbers. And they felt that if they had a larger voting public, they would have more influence. Um, Wyoming territory was actually the first um, to approve women's suffrage in 1869. And the momentum that the West had um, caused the national suffrage organizations to put a lot more time and attention into the West um, in trying to get the women's suffrage amendments passed. Um, in 1905, Portland was hosting the Lewis and Clark Exposition and World's Fair. And because of that, the country's largest suffrage group, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, um, decided to hold their annual conference in Portland at the same time. And here you see a program from that conference, and um, that conference actually included Susan B. Anthony as a speaker. Um, and this, the conference was held at the First Congregational Church, which um, was, that's the one right across the street from OHS, um, right across Madison Street. Uh, so the conference resulted in a lot of enhanced momentum for the suffrage movement in Oregon, and a lot more women and men uh, moved to form uh, new suffrage organizations. There was also a really strong push to use the new referendum system, um, which would get more easily get the suffrage question on the ballot. So activists put uh, suffrage on the ballot in Oregon more times than any other state. Um, there were six times total between 1884 and 1912. And this is a ballot from the exhibit um, from 1910. And in the lower right corner, um, I know you can't read it probably, but in the lower right corner is the woman's suffrage question. Um, so there were many activists who were active in the Oregon suffrage movement, um, but none more than Abigail Scott Dunaway. Uh, she was particularly significant because, first of all, just the longevity of her service towards the women's suffrage movement. Um, she fought the entire time for the four decades from the early 1870s until women's suffrage passed in Oregon in 1912. Um, she also was very active um, in getting the word out nationally. She had a few different uh, newspapers, women's rights newspapers that she published, including the New Northwest, um, which was a suffrage newspaper that had national circulation. For more than 40 years, she worked to influence politicians and civic leaders um, and was instr instrumental in getting 
the suffrage question on the ballot each and every time, um, all six times that it was on the ballot. And um, personally, I'm just in awe of the perseverance and strength that would take to work for 40 years for the same the same issue and you know not ever give up. Um, so she was a pretty amazing person. So, and we have a few objects that belong to her in the exhibit. Um, this is her typewriter, which uh, she was very, she was famous for kind of her work behind the scenes. She liked to quietly influence politicians and other civic leaders. So she wrote a lot of letters and um, this is the typewriter, one of the typewriters she used to write those letters. Um, the trophy is a trophy that she was presented in 1912 by the Rose Festival in honor of her service towards the cause of women's suffrage. And as with most movements, there are always people with opposing viewpoints and suffrage was certainly no exception. Um, I personally was surprised to learn about the large number of women who were opposed to their own enfranchisement. That was very common. Um, and Oregon also had a large anti-suffrage organization, which included some very prominent uh, Oregon women. So because anti-suffragists did not believe that um, women should be involved in politics, they typically spoke out by writing editorials or publishing flyers or postcards um, like these. <laughs> And these kind of seem comedic, but um, there was clearly a true concern that um, men would be left to do the housework and take care of the children while women were out voting and protesting. And um, so, yeah, obviously that wasn't considered a very happy scenario at that time. Um, so I also found it very interesting in researching this exhibit that um, some of the people who were most active in the anti-suffrage organizations, immediately upon uh, Oregon passing the Women's Suffrage Amendment in 1912, they immediately registered to vote. Um, so here you see a couple of different voter registration cards. Um, one was for, and these were both from uh, leaders of the anti-suffrage movement. Um, one was Henrietta Failing there on the bottom. She was the curator of the Portland Art Museum. And then the other up top is uh, Catherine McCammett, who was the wife of, she was the president of the anti-suffrage group and um, the wife of Oregon Supreme Court Justice Wallace Kamet. So after more than 40 years of activism, um, suffragists finally declared victory in Oregon with the passage of equal suffrage in 1912. This is a copy of the proclamation and Oswald, the governor um, at the time, Oswald West, as um, a way to honor her, asked Abigail Scott Dunaway if she would handwrite the proclamation. So this is her handwriting here. After many years of waiting to exercise their right to vote, um, many women quickly ran out to register to vote in the following months um, after the passage of the proclamation. Um, so these are some voter registration cards from that time period, um, including some cards belonging to a couple of African-American suffragists, um, Hattie Redmond there on the top, and then Beatrice Moreau Kennedy. Um, she was a co-founder and ed editor of The Advocate, Oregon's largest black owned newspaper. And Hattie Redmond was um, a founder. This is Hattie Redmond. Um, she was a founder of the uh, perhaps first and only um, African-American suffrage association in Oregon. Suffrage also meant that women were eligible to serve in political office. Um, so in 1915, Marion B. Town of Jackson County became the first woman to claim a seat in the Oregon House of Representatives. And Catherine Clark of Douglas County became the first woman to uh, hold a seat in the Oregon Senate. This is a handwritten speech by Sylvia Thompson. 
and she was Oregon's third female legislator in 1916. Um, she ran on a Democratic ticket in Wasco County. Um, and she notes in her speech that hereafter, there will be no question of sex in the election of legislators. Thompson was also the person that proposed ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Oregon Congress um, after it was passed by the US Congress in June of 1919. Most Western states had achieved suffrage by about 1914, um, but activists were still working for a national amendment that would guarantee suffrage for all. Um, tactics had changed over the years. Uh, the original conferences and um, working behind the scenes to influence politicians had gradually changed over to um, more active actions like protests and marches um, that happened generally in the first two decades of the 20th century. And this is a remarkable sash that we have featured in the exhibit. Um, it's over 100 years old and it was loaned by Oregon attorney, Jane Paulson. Her grandmother, Harriet Nabbitt, uh, wore this sash in suffrage parades in the 19 teens. After a decade of protests, marches, and even hunger strikes, activists finally achieved their goal of national voting rights for women with the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. This is a telegram from National American Women's Suffrage Association President Carrie Chapman Catt to Oregon suffrage leader F.E. Comstock Simmons, and they are discussing the work to achieve state ratifications of the amendment. Oregon ratified in January 1920, and Tennessee finally became the 36th and final state needed to ratify in August 1920. Carrie Chapman Catt, seen here on the right with another suffrage leader, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, um, founded the National League of Women Voters that same year. And this is the text of the 19th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. But even with the 19th Amendment, it would be decades before all American citizens could vote. This is a photo of Clara Elizabeth Chan Lee. Um, she's on the far right. And she was born in Portland. Um, she became the first Chinese American woman to register to vote in the US in 1911. Um, she was living in California at the time. And California, California had passed women's suffrage in 1911. However, Chinese Americans born outside of the US could not vote until the Magnuson Act of 1943, um, followed a decade later by the McCarran Walter Act, which guaranteed all Asian immigrants voting rights through naturalized citizenship. Then in 1924, the Snyder Act admitted US citizenship to Native Americans, but suffrage continued as a state decision. So Native Americans did not achieve full suffrage in all 50 states until 1962. Even with voting rights leg legislation, politicians in some areas of the country, particularly the South, have divided, devised ways to block and suppress African-American voting rights, um, including poll taxes, literacy tests, and physical intimidation. Um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 forbid states from using a lot of these tactics, but um, parts of this act have since been struck down and many racist practices unfortunately continue today, such as gerrymandering, um, ID requirements and illegal stri striking of voters from the rolls. Um, and that's still going on every day in our country, unfortunately. In 1923, after working to achieve the 19th Amendment, um, suffrage leader Alice Paul proposed the Equal Rights Amendment to ensure equal rights under the law for all women. Although women had achieved the right to vote, they still did not have uh, full protection against gender discrimination and they still did not 
have a guarantee of equal rights with men. The ERA was not passed by Congress until about 60 years later, and only last year it was ratified by the minimum number of states needed. Um, of course, it is still not in a, fully an amendment today because the ratification did not come through within the designated time period. Um, although the House just voted last week, I think it was like eight days ago, uh, to remove the time limit um, finally. And it's now going to the Senate for a vote there. So hopefully <laughs> something's finally happening with that. So that's just a brief overview with some highlights. And I do hope you'll come visit in person when you feel comfortable. Um, at this point, I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you.